Hello, I'm Wesley and Mayor Bill Wild. Part of my responsibility as mayor is to connect with other leaders in our region, across the state and across the country, to collaborate and share best practices. The City of Wesleyan belongs to several organizations which allow us to pool resources and to share knowledge to make each participating community stronger. And one of these organizations is the Conference of Western Wayne, or the CWW. Wesleyan is one of 18 communities that make up the CWW, which works to enhance the lives for over 700,000 residents and 100,000 businesses collectively. Each month, the chief elected officials of the 18 communities that make up Western Wayne County meet to discuss key legislation and regional issues affecting all of our communities. The meeting place rotates between all the members, and most recently it was Westland's honor to host the group. So please, take the time to watch this meeting and see what the CWW is all about and how the City of Westland benefits from this organization. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the City of Westland. Uh, no, no presentation this morning, Mayor. Just uh, wanted to, mm -hmm. to welcome everybody to Westland and encourage everybody at the dais and in the audience to uh, help themselves to the refreshments that we have in the City Council uh, Council Conference Room. It's courtesy of uh, the City of Westland Senior Resource Department. So with that, I ask you to join me in saying the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mayor Turnbull, roll call. Let's go to the roll call here. Uh, right here. Uh, gay or nay, if you're here today. Belleville City. Here. Dearborn City. Here. Dearborn Heights City. Here. Garden City City. Inkster. Inkster. Going once, twice. Livonia. Present. Super. Northville. I am here. Plymouth. Here. Romulus. Present. Wayne. Here. Westland. Here. Now the townships. Canton. Here. Huron Township. Here. Northville Township. Here. Plymouth Township. Here. Redford Township. Here. Sumter. Here. Van Buren Township. Here. Great. We have a quorum. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Now we're going to do audience and board introductions. Laura, can you start? Laura Haynes, Conference of Western Wayne. Anne Marie Graham Hudak, Canton Township Supervisor. Brian Turnbull, Mayor of the City of Northville. Mark Adams, Northville Township Supervisor. Kurt Heisey, Plymouth Township Supervisor. Jordan Sullivan, Hopkins Western Wayne. John Racy, Mayor of the City of Wayne. Bill Wild, Mayor of City of Westland. Maureen Miller Braston, Mayor of City of Livonia. Good morning, Mary Dreer, City of Romulus Economic Development Coordinator and Aaron Topolis Treasurer. Mary Conley, Mayor of City of Belleville. Kevin McMurray, Supervisor, Van Muren Township. David Lake, Aaron Township Supervisor. Ben Craver, the Township Supervisor. Jamie Lynch, City of Belleville City. Bill Bassey, Mayor City of Tim Rush, Trustee and Deputy Supervisor, Sumter Township. Laura Reinhardt, Deputy Director of the Tony Sebastian, Team of Deerfoot. Craig Brown, Chief Innovation Officer, City of Westland. Yeah, Dan Kisporski, Comments of Walter. Okay, sir. Go ahead. Uh, Eddie Fakor, I'm with uh, Wayne County Executive Office, Director of Government and Community Relations. Hi everyone, Chris Girdwood, Detroit Region Air Travels. Jennifer Seibel, Groveworks. Laura Reiners, Groveworks. Kimmy Burkhart, Groveworks. Shannon Price, Capital Relations. Emma Olson, Senior Alliance. Joe Burton, Municipal Service Bureau Director, City of Westland. Good morning, Julian Campbell, City of Westland Community Development and Housing Director. Good morning, City of Westland, City Controller and Person Director, Kevin Adams. David Riley, Building Director of Westland. <coughs> Hello, Chad Ball, Police Chief. Hello, Jamie White, Figure of Health. Hassan Saab, City of Westland. Eliana Hussain, the Rest Foundation. Nadia Nasser, School Board, and Jim Heights. Dan Block, Budget Director, City of Westland. C. Pascal Easy, Chief Diversity Officer, City of Westland. 
Jennifer Stamper, the assessor of Huron Township, VM Huron Township, Sumter Township, as well as the cities of Belleville, Plymouth, Wayne, and Westland. Dan Selman, Deputy Supervisor of Oldie Van Buren Township. <laughs> <laughs> I am Kathy Harvey, and I'm representing the Western Wayne County Fire Department Mutual Aid Association. Good morning, I'm Diane Webb, Superintendent of Redford Township with stupendous timing. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Morton, Westland DPS. Scott Holtz, Finance Director, Sumter Township. Good morning, Paul Matz, Westland Youth Assistance. Uh, good morning. <coughs> Excuse me, Terry Rocky, Wayne County Commissioner, District Nine. This is Rose, my granddaughter, and Jordan's niece. Mm -hmm. Her mom's in the hospital having a baby. Just mm -hmm. so good. Good morning. Um, good morning, City of Westland uh, Deputy Fire Chief Daryl Stanford, James Morris, Westland Fire Chief, Greg Barra, Facility Director, City of Westland. Craig Ward, Dad, Elm Park, Michigan. Haley Brown, the representative of Congressman Debbie Dingle. Dennis Davidson, representing uh, the Wayne County Treasurer, Eric Sabri. Okay, great, thank you. Next up is the adoption of the agenda. Great. Again, welcome everybody again on this Friday the 13th. Uh, I know I was on here earlier, but uh, looking at uh, the package and the adoption of the minutes, I didn't see any uh, additions or deletions. They looked accurate to me. Uh, did anybody on uh, the, the board here see any deletions or uh, adds to that? Are we doing the agenda? Yeah, we got to oh, I got a little excited there. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> the minutes are I was getting right to the minutes instead of that. There was Thank a you. We're just cruising. <laughs> yeah, the tomato um, juice went right to the head this morning. Thank you. Duly noted. Can we move? Can we move uh, growth works up above uh, directors' reports? Are you fine with that? You want to get that a second? Yeah, I'll second it too. Okay. Any anything else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Now. So now we already had the introduction here. So uh, <laughs> looking at the minutes from the previous meeting, I didn't see any deletions or uh, additions. But anybody on the board that has any deletions or deletions? Good. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. Director's report. All right, we're going to move that uh, presentation for Growth Works. Oh, it's missing. Treasurer's report. Oh, sorry. That's Treasurer's bad. report is missing on my sheet. <laughs> that is my, my bad. I'm sorry. That's okay. Treasurer's report. Um, okay, so you have uh, in your packet two reports, both the March and the April report. Um, everything looks normal as you go through March. Um, all of a sudden you hit April and you'll notice that there are close to $3 million in additional receipts. Uh, that is the state 911 payment. Uh, so good news for all of the municipal members here. Uh, disbursements will be made shortly to the communities uh, that are uh, going to be eligible for those receipts. So that is it for the Treasurer's report. And ask for the of the Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now, growth works. Good morning. Good morning. Then there it is. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Seidel. I am the director at Growth Works for our Care Management Organization Department and our Youth Assistance Programming Department. So today we're going to give a quick brief overview of our Youth Assistance Programming <coughs> services, otherwise our diversion programming for youth that are at risk um, or displaying at-risk behaviors of being involved in the juvenile justice system. Currently, this is our current demographics. This is from fiscal year 21 to current. Our eligible referrals for uh, young people to receive services, so common referral reasons are listed to the right. Status offenses, undisciplined juvenile, communication threats, curfew threats. Well, I don't need to read. I'm sure everybody can see that clearly. Um, eligible youth for age in Wayne County to receive these services is 11. It says 17. Actually, that is 17 and a half as a result of raise the age legislation that was passed um, back in 21. This is from fiscal year 21 to current, um, just some of the referral offenses, the actual offenses. So these are offenses that 
they are being referred to us to receive prevention services in lieu of their JCO1 or their petition being sent down to the prosecutor's office at their judicial circuit court with the goal of they receive these services and then they no longer will be placed on a formal docket to receive formal charges. These are referrals by the cities that we've received referrals from. The other communities would be some of the communities we have fellow partner youth assistance programming. Mr. Motz is in the audience today who runs one of those for the city of Westland. So some of the other communities that we re receive referrals from might be a transfer from one of those other local communities to receive services that might be closer to that client or that family rather than the youth assistance program in their community or there might be a service that we are offering that they can't receive at their local youth assistance program and those would be transferred over to us and vice versa. We may transfer some of our clients as well for those same reasons to other youth assistance programs for diversion services. So the process is quite simple. A referral is completed. What's nice about this for clients to receive diversion, diversion services is that it's not just the prosecutor's office downtown that must send a referral, which is their right track program. Referrals are able to be sent in by parents, schools, uh, police, and mental health agencies. And in fact, with our police departments, a couple of our local police departments have established MOUs with our agency to allow for that to happen quite quickly, which is nice because then we are intervening fairly quickly to respond to that client's behavior rather than it taking however long it might take for that process to take place if it was sent down to the prosecutor's office. So once the referral is received within our agency, our team does an assessment to determine what the needs of that client are not just simply based on what might be the offense that brought them or the behavior that brought them into our doors, but really what's going on. And then from there, we place them into our program based on those assessments. So quite honestly, there could be an intervention by a police officer or school on a Monday, and by Friday, that client could be receiving services or within a couple weeks, worst case scenario. Some of the programs that we offer at GrowthWorks, we have a life skills group, individual therapy, mentoring groups for females and males, family therapy, and outpatient subst substance abuse treatment. So currently, these are just some of our numbers as far as what services are being accessed by those clients that are coming into our door for diversion or prevention services. We have FY21 and then FY22 thus far. The prevention substance abuse groups, we began that last year in response to a need that we saw with our clients. And the average time for youth that are in our substance abuse track is typically about six months. And the average length of time for those that are accessing life skills is three months. Some of our outcomes for our diversion program, in FY21, we had 79 clients served, 70% completed the terms and conditions of the program, meaning that whatever that behavior or that petition that might have been sent down was able to be erased and they didn't have to be formally placed on the docket downtown. FY22 thus far, 96 diversion clients have been serviced. 77% of those have completed the terms and conditions of the program. And some of our reasons for possibly clients not completing the program, sometimes they require higher level of care or more intensive services needed. Possibly a parent has refused these services or just simply they did not participate in the program once referred. And at that point, we notify the referring entity, and then they follow suit with what are the next steps. So in some circumstances, unfortunately, the JCO1 or that petition will then be followed through and filed downtown, and they will be placed on the formal docket. At this point, I'm going to have Laura, our Community Relations Director, speak to one more service that GrowthWorks is providing at this time for the communities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. We want to thank the Executive Director, Jordan, for having us here. Um, GrowthWorks has played a, a serious role in this community. I think one of the reasons why GrowthWorks is grateful for this opportunity is we've continued to evolve to meet the needs of all the different communities in the Conference of Western Wayne. Many of you still know us kind of as that original substance use organization, um, but we've really grown in our the juvenile justice component of what we provide to all of your 
your, all of your communities is very important. And I think why it's important to talk about the youth assistance program today is because that's that early intervention program. That's when we can work with each one of your communities, not when a kid is already having serious issues, but right when they're starting to have some of those early signs, like mom and dad are witnessing some problems at home, teachers are having issues, or if it does get to the point of the police department. So for the communities that we have worked with, that we've got the formal MOU, we're grateful for that. I think you saw by some of the numbers that Jen showed that we're getting a lot more referrals. And I know we've had other initial conversations with some of the other communities that we really just want to be here to serve you. Um, I think you all know that GrowthWorks is not just a provider, but we provide also some of the administrative support for the youth assistance program across the Conference of Western Wayne. So we just want to make sure that all of you know that whether it's one or two referrals a year or more than 50 referrals a year to this program, we're here to serve your communities, to help work with families, work with those kids as early as possible so that hopefully they don't work with us in the formal case management organization. Um, the other thing that we just wanted to address today that we briefly got to mention, I believe it was back in February, was some of the work that we're doing around mental health and suicide prevention. Um, so this is some of the work that the Western Wayne Suicide Prevention Coalition is doing. Cindy Malik had the opportunity to address you a few months back. Um, she's got a long history in education. Really what her role is doing is working with the superintendents all the way down to some of the ancillary staff in the school district, making sure that they all know what some of those signs are, those early signs of suicide in our students students because that's what we're trying to prevent is any adolescent suicide here within the communities that we serve. Um, so we've got some great events coming up um, in June 27th and November 8th. We're going to be doing some training, hopefully, of over a thousand individuals in QPR training. Um, and GrowthWorks is working with some other organizations, including Hygera, who I know is here today, St. Mary's or Trinity Health Livonia Hospital, and a number of other entities in the area, because really this needs to be a community approach. It can't just be the schools. It can't just be your municipalities. It can't just be GrowthWorks. It's all of us working together to try and find different ways that we can be combative adding this. Um, the other thing that we're doing, I know we're working very closely with the City of Livonia, City of Plymouth, and some of your other communities that are supporting this as well. Next week, GrowthWorks is hosting two mental health events, really to bring together the schools, the municipalities, public safety, so that there can be a voice from that side in terms of what we're seeing in terms of mental health and the needs in our community. And then we can also connect youth, families, adults with some of the services that GrowthWorks and some of the other agencies that you guys are working with, just to make sure that the community knows Yes, we're seeing this on our side too. There is an increase, increasing need for these services and this is what we can do to help you. Um, so at this point, if there are any questions either about the Youth Assistance Program, Mental Health, or the Suicide Prevention Work GrowthWorks is doing, be more than happy to answer them. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jordan, the director's report. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a couple updates before we get into um, our committee discussions on mental health and the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, this year's 2022 Western Wayne Business Leadership Banquet will be held on Tuesday, October 4th at the Henry the Autograph Collection in Dearborn, same place as the last event. There will be a 4 p.m. networking mixer and then 6 p.m. dinner and presentation. Um, the CWW Board of Directors always receives complimentary tickets for the event, and the promotion flyer is at your seat um, if you'd like to look at more detail, and uh, there was also an electronic copy that was emailed with the board, board packet. Quick um, second quarter, January, March update on rescue recovery. So this is um, our rescue recovery program that we partner with St. Mary Mercy Livonia and also the Girl Clerks. So from January to March, there were 318 clients served, um, asked if they would like to have peer support services, and 285 of the 318 requested to have the peer support services. Um, this, is, this number is what was offered through St. Mary Mercy Livonia Hospital, and of the 285 clients that had requested services, 196 of those had contact with a peer coach. On the next page to show some different tables and numbers um, that may be of interest to you, the average response time to the hospital from the peer recovery coach has been averaging about 60 minutes, which is really pretty fast. They are available 24-7. Um, so the 196, which is 69% of the 285, continued, um, followed through with some level of continued 
engagement, which is really good. So that would either be entering treatment or maintaining ongoing peer recovery coach contact. During this reporting period, the peer recovery coaches have had approximately 4,406 contacts with current program participants and have averaged seven contacts per client. So clients remain engaged for an average of three months, although some continue in services much longer. I'm really coming out of COVID, this is a very good quarter in terms of how many people were served. Um, the state grant funding for this project is included in both the governor's proposed budget and the House's proposed budget. So once the Senate and the House meet for conference committee on the DDG just budget, budget, excuse me, we will know um, more if it is included in the entire budget for 2023. Um, this is our last meeting prior to breaking for summer. Unfortunately, there were scheduled conflicts in June. Um, one, my brother's getting married on one June date, and the other June date is Mackinac Policy Conference. So we, um, a lot of the board is attending the Mackinac Policy Conference, so speaking with the executive committee, we are canceling June. Um, we've put some things that we normally do in June onto this meeting, and one of those things is the executive committee authorization. So because we are not meeting in June, July, and August, I need the CWW Executive Committee to be authorized to act on standard board issues with the ability to call a special meeting for the full board if necessary. So the resolution would give that um, authority to the Executive Committee from May 14th, 2022 to September 8th, 2022, being that our next meeting is sub excuse me, September 9th, 2022 at the Township. I just need approval for that. Move the resolution. I support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And since we moved growth works up to um, the beginning of the discussions, I'm also going to switch around our <coughs> subcommittee discussions and start with CWW Mental Health. So, Ms. Nasser, would you like to come up? Uh, Ms. Maddie Nasser is going to speak on her efforts in spearheading a youth mental health suicide prevention program. And then um, Mayor Brasson is going to give us a brief introduction to a program that Wallonia has implemented, and we'll have a brief video, and then we will talk. First off, I'd like to thank you guys so much for having us here today. It is a complete honor. Um, to be in front of you today. My name is Nadia Nasser. I'm a student at the University of Michigan Dearborn. I reside in Dearborn Heights um, and I am on the D7 school board uh, in Dearborn Heights. Uh, thank you. My name is Eliana Hussein. Um, I also go to the University of Michigan Dearborn with Nadia as a business major. Um, full time, I'm an insurance agent with you know retirement life, those types of things, and we're both board members of the Rahman Foundation. Yeah. Uh, so basically, the Rahman Foundation is a new foundation. It was uh, spearheaded and started in 2018 in the city of Northville. Um, we have chapters in Pakistan as well as the U.S., and me and Nadia are in charge of those decisions that are made in the U.S. Um, so we've just done a couple different things. Uh, we support a lot of uh, different initiatives in the U.S. Like, for example, we currently support NAMI, the American Psychiatric Foundation, um, the Sound Vision for Youth Mental Health and Suicide Prevention, as well as the Rian Center in Plymouth, Michigan. Uh, so currently in November, me and Nadia actually came up with this idea of creating mental health journals, which I'm, some of you have on your desk. Looks like this, cute and green, with some other colors. Um, so basically we created and distributed these mental health journal journals to over a thousand students from Annapolis High School, Dearborn High School, Fortson High School, Etzel Ford High School, and Melvindale High School. Um, so basically in these journals, uh, if you turn to the first page, it's just a little bit of the story about the Rahmat Foundation and how it started. Um, this foundation is named actually after our cousin. His name was Rahmat and unfortunately he passed away from suicide. So that's really where the passion comes from for this foundation. So it's uh, very close to home. As well as our second page talks about our goal and what we initially wanted to do with the journal was really to help out students. As you can see, obviously everyone here experienced COVID. Um, and when COVID hit in 2020, actually, I was a senior in high school, so I missed my prom, those types of things, which is obviously not a big deal, but to other people, you know, we look forward to those, uh, senior year things. And also you have to realize there are seventh graders that suddenly they were ninth grade in person. So they missed that graduation. They suddenly went from middle school to high school. It's a big transition. And a lot of people are also, you know, in school for two years online. That's also another big transition. So that's really where the idea of the journals came from. And uh, so, 
Um, <clears throat> so at first, initially, we were like, okay, let's get these to the schools in Dearborn Heights. Let's see what the outcome is and let's see how people respond to this. We brought the journals there to all the schools that she mentioned, uh, just in Dearborn Heights and in Dearborn. Um, and it, the support just is like huge. Uh, we printed initially a thousand journals and we, they're gone now. Um, and we're in a new batch of printing them. And not only are they in the schools, but now they've reached the psychiatric hospitals, Havenwick. Um, and I think one in Wyandotte, um, and one in Henry Ford. And so what we, we're here today is because we want to offer our support. We want, as local elected officials, we'd like you to start conversations and see where people are, where the students are, where the veterans are, where the constituents are, because this is a, we're in a pandemic, but we're in also an epidemic. This is huge. Um, and we really need to be able to talk about this openly and bring this out in meetings and talk to our constituents, host workshops, and really just be there for the residents and for the people within the state of Michigan. Um, this is such a heavy topic. You know, as a student who just graduated, um, I had huge mental health issues. I actually was hospitalized my senior year, and I was one of the best students in high school. So I can't imagine what students who weren't as outspoken as me went through. Um, and so I take my struggles and I take what I went through and I take all of that emotion and passion and I want to help other students and other people within the state of Michigan and people who look like me, who aren't like me, you know, how we all come through different walks of life. It's, this is just such a huge thing that I don't think can wait. How can we expect our students, how can we expect our constituents to succeed if they're not mentally strong, if they're not mentally there? Um, I think it's just a huge thing and I'm so incredibly passionate, which is why I brought you here to, I'm here today. Um, thanks to Mayor Bazzi, he invited me to come speak today. And so we wanna offer our support from the Rahmat Foundation. Uh, the Rahmat Foundation actually, uh, the founder is actually the founder of Apex Behavioral Health in Dearborn and they're always accepting new patients. So we have that, um, we have that as well. We have funds to donate to other organizations and uh, we're looking to speak in front of students and speak in front of people and large bodies of um, government to kind of raise awareness and really um, have these tough conversations that we haven't seen before. We're in a different time, we're in a different era, and I think this is a huge topic, and I, I'm really glad I'm here to talk to you guys about it, because like I said, it's huge, and we really need to address it, we really do. Thank you. Um, another thing we've also done is we've held um, two um, fundraisers, basically to raise awareness for mental health and also put name recognition to the Rahma Foundation. So for example, Mayor Bill Bazzi, he was actually at our second annual charity fashion gala in February in Dearborn, and it was a very successful event. Something that you think about, obviously all of you guys always go to you know events all the time, fundraisers, not, I, I grew up going to them. And usually to me, I would bring my Harry Potter book because I knew the drill to be quiet and sit down, yeah. you know? Um, not make any noise, don't interrupt anything because of the speakers. And to me, obviously, it was boring. Like, I'm only five, six, seven years old. It's boring. You know, they're just talking, we eat, and we leave. For us, the whole point was to bring awareness to mental health, raise some money for the journals, and also to have everyone have a good time. Because, you know, mental health is obviously a big topic, and it's not something everyone likes to talk about. So if you bring entertainment to it, if you bring a show to it, people want to come, and they'll hear a story, and we'll put a show on for them. So what we did was we... Um, we did like a diversity fashion show. We had uh, five different lines of clothing. We had a dance performance. We had an amazing dinner at Biblos. It was a very good night. And we hosted about 430 people, as well as March um, at the Dearborn Ford Community Arts Center. We held a talent show, and it was the exact same thing. It was a talent show for um, 10 different contestants. And we also you know, gave money to each contestant, cash prizes. And that also raised awareness for the Rahma Foundation, as well as me and Nadia have also um, presented to several different key clubs in Michigan, as well as um, Model, UN. Model UN clubs and different service organizations in high school like that as well to bring awareness to them. Because it's different when you just donate the books to school, you give it to the principal and you call it a day. That's not what we're trying to do. We're also trying to talk to the students because if you just, like usually when we were in high school, we were in middle school, elementary school, it is when someone donates a book to the school, you put it in your backpack and you don't really do anything with it. We know that. And so what we did is we talked to those students. If you want to take one, you take one. If you don't, that's okay. You know, and a lot of people did take them and a lot of people have used them because we've even held like like little like contests and you know scholarship prizes and if off of answering one prompt and we got over 500 prompt responses from high school students in the Wayne County area. So we've done a lot of amazing work, you know, despite COVID since 2018, and we're just looking to continue that. 
a couple of our other projects coming up this summer uh, in the city of Dearborn Heights. We're going to host um, in the park, painting in the park, where we t have a mental professional come and talk about the importance of finding an outlet and finding something um, that allows you to relax and to kind of cope with everything you're going through. And we plan to have music and these canvases in the park, just like painting with the sun over gleaming over your head. And it's going to be such a beautiful event. Uh, we also have some uh, lectures and some workshops planned, as well as coffee hours. We plan to do this thing monthly where we, the founders of the Foundation, we find a coffee shop in a different city within Wayne County. We invite constituents, we invite people to just openly talk. And each month we'll have a different topic to talk about, whether it be emotions, whether it be grief, regret, anything. And we invite everyone to have a cup of coffee and just have an open discussion, not a lecture, but a discussion and kind of understand uh, what each other are going through and how we can relate and how we can help each other out. Because what else are we here for? <laughs> like, um, so yeah, we thank you for our time. Um, we have a lot of journals. If anyone in the audience would like a journal, uh, we're printing a whole new batch of probably five to 10,000. And we want to get them in the schools. We want to get them at meetings um, in the libraries. We have them in the Dearborn Heights libraries. Um, and we really want to help as many people as possible. So we'll be available in the um, audience if you guys have any questions. But thank you so much. Again, we appreciate it. Thank you both for being thank here. You. If you want to um, send me the list of all your events, and I'll make sure to get it out to yeah, the board. Sure. And then of course. If you want to send it on to the residents. Yeah. Can... Thank you so much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Um, so our mental health subcommittee chair by Supervisor Graham Hudak, one of the biggest thing that we've talked about is that mental health is across the board the struggles you just heard about um the youth and so now we're going to transition into struggles with um senior citizen mental health so boring Oops, sorry <laughs> no thank you um I think it's fantastic that we get a chance to hear both ends of the spectrum and we all know um, how much need there is in between that. Um, so like many of you, um, we've heard a lot about the need for mental health services in our communities. And you know, when we think back, those uh, needs predated uh, the pandemic, but clearly the pandemic has amplified so much of that need. Um, many of your communities have taken on this issue and I have to say, I'm extremely proud uh, to be part of the community community at large uh, that is really working hard to get their arms around the mental health services that are needed in our region. And um, I commend uh, Anne-Marie for the work that she did in pulling together the task force and the notion that we even needed a task force like this um, here in the Conference of Western Range. So uh, Supervisor Hodek, uh, congrats to you. And I think the, the task force is off on a really good start. Um, one of the things that I've been asked to do today is to present to you uh, what it is that we've done in the city of Livonia. You know, uh, following the pandemic, we recognized that one of the community uh, members or groups in our community hardest hit by this were our, was our senior population. Clearly hardest hit by the pandemic itself. Uh, Livonia found, and we learned that we had 22% of all of the long-term health care facilities in the county were located in our city. So that sensitized us immediately to the health needs of our Livonia seniors in long-term care facilities. The fallout of all of that was that we quickly learned about the mental health needs. And we have um, in the city a number of independent living facilities and city-owned um, senior living facilities. So we went in and we surveyed. And of the 200 people uh, that we surveyed, uh, the responses came back, uh, into, and this was throughout six of our housing units, 38% of the residents said that social isolation had affected their mental health in the last year. And 36% of those seniors also reported feeling an increased level of grief as a result of the pandemic. So when that data became relevant and relatable to us, um, our housing commission partnered with our fire department and they teamed up to expand the mental health services resources in those independent living facilities. And we used money from the CARES Act. Uh, we used some of our CDBG funds as well uh, to pull together a pilot program that has just now started to scratch the surface. Uh, we found that indeed uh, there is a clear need and we are beginning to meet that need in terms of responding to seniors. We introduced a program uh, that is a health first aid training 
program for our seniors who live in our senior communities. And what this does is it trains all of the members of that community, anybody interested in being a health first aid provider, um, can be trained on what to look for in their neighbors. So it's a neighbor to neighbor program. Um, and we're looking to identify pre-crisis signals and make sure that people understand where appropriate services then reside. We were astounded at the number of seniors who raised their hands to be trained as health aid providers in each one of our senior living facilities. And as a result, um, we've created a lot of opportunities for, for conversations around mental health. And even probably bigger than that, is that we have been able to track nine senior suicides that we've present, prevented as a result of this program. And it's only existed for, I think, eight months at this point. So this was significant enough to us that we've continued the program. We're hoping that it provides a pilot and maybe something that other communities um, would appreciate a chance to learn more about. We introduced it to our community at our, um, at our annual um, uh, mayor's conversation, and we have a video that does, I think, a pretty good job of showcasing what it is that uh, define the need for us and how we've just begun uh, to meet that need. So um, I think we're ready to roll the tape. You know, when we started the COVID re response with uh, testing and vaccinating our citizens, both in the senior complexes and at the senior center, um, our crews were able to interact with these folks on a very personal level. Uh, many of them have been, had been isolated for a very long time. Um, they had not been out to see anybody, their family, their loved ones, their friends. Um, our crews were some of the first people uh, that a lot of these folks had uh, the ability to encounter. And what our crews noticed is these folks were truly uh, saddened. They were scared. Uh, they had been isolated for a long time. And they picked up very quickly that these people, um, in many instances, were suffering with a lot of um, anxiety and depression. And they truly were in need of assistance. And over time, they became fearful to go out and start engaging in the community once uh, activities and social functions started um, ramping back up. During a survey that we completed, we found that at least 25% of the seniors within the communities were suffering from depression and anxiety. Um, so then we started focusing on their emotional wellness. People get in a habit of doing different things, which now is staying home. and. Uh, it's changed their personalities a lot. Where everybody used to be very open, went and visited everybody, but they don't do that anymore. I wanna see, I wanna see people interact more and be more involved. Um, because isolation isn't the key of life. It's interacting with people. Across the last two years, COVID has provided us the opportunity to improve our understanding of our community's mental health needs. The City of Livonia has responded to these needs in multiple ways, meeting our residents wherever they are in need, whether that's calling senior residents who feel isolated as a result of the pandemic, offering crisis prevention trainings to residents of city-owned housing facilities, or connecting them with needed services through our crisis support team. The Senior Emotional Wellness Program started over the summer with a survey that we did of the residents at the independent living facilities in the city of Livonia. We then did mental health first aid training with all of our housing staff in conjunction with the fire department and we also offered some trainings for our seniors in the independent living facilities which included Question, Persuade, Refer, which is a suicide awareness training, Mental Health 101, and Conflict Resolution. I think everybody should be going through it. I really do. Uh, not because you're going to be called upon to go out and solve everybody's problems, but it helps you to understand people. And so I've had my highs and my lows, 
and I sought counseling, but I realized there are a lot of people that I've come across in my lifetime that were shamed and that, um, you know, that the fear of rejection and, um, but they just, you know, put it on a back burner that they have a mental health issue. I have found out since there that I do have days when I'm down and I say some of the things that uh, we learned to recognize other people. I find myself thinking the same way and then how to address it and it'll go away. But I find that very illuminating. I wouldn't have thought I was like that because I look at the overall picture, not little parts. I guess I'm the same as anybody else. I have the same problems and the same issues. So we brought the letter writing campaign together through a partnership with Schoolcraft College, um, where, which actually came through a trainer that we used for our mental health first aid training. And we were able to partner with the Schoolcraft Student Activities Center to create Schoolcraft students for Livonia seniors, which um, brought together about 50 different people from Schoolcraft that came to the event and wrote the cards for the seniors and then we were able to mail them out. So going forward, we intend on increasing the activities at our independent living facilities as well as continuing on with our letting, letter writing campaign and hopefully expanding it beyond just the three living facilities that our city owned. Um, also, we intend on doing more trainings and seminars for our seniors at their individual properties so they're more um, able to attend the trainings and feel more comfortable doing so. I think that moving forward, um, are we ever really going to see the old normal? I think what we're going to have is a new normal. Um, hopefully it's a new normal that uh, will help us to place a better emphasis on the needs of the senior community and what they need. Um, and that it does go beyond just providing an activity and hoping that people show up. Um, it's an activity of engagement and learning and really getting to know who your support systems are. In fact, I have one of my daughters and she's getting a new home and she's been after me to come live with her. I can't. I have to give up everybody here. I would love to live with her. We get along fine. But I've got 120 people. And truly, we are all friends. So um, thank you uh, for your time and attention. As you can see, it's a multi-dimensional program that we have here um, that involves the community as well in engaging in this. And I think the... Um, the pitch that I'd like to make uh, to the commission um, and to the conference as a whole is I think we've got a unique opportunity here. Um, this is clearly a, a group of people that have perhaps gone unrecognized in terms of their need for service um, in all of our communities. Um, so I would hope that as we advance our conversations around how we provide better mental health services to uh, all the people in our community that we make sure to highlight our senior citizens. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Mayor. Supervisor, would you like to oh, sure. add anything? Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Brosnan. That was very good. It's interesting because our Club 55 manager just this week asked for a social worker just for that group that, as they call it, you know, showed up for exercises and things. So we know that there are a lot of people in their homes. So I think this would be a great video to send out to everybody and describe your training program. Thank you. But I also want to say, you know, the young ladies that were here really blew me away. Um, you know, you guys did a great job. When uh, Three years ago, I lost a niece. Um, she died by suicide. Um, she was a senior at Plymouth Salem High School, and her, her name was Jillian. And so I wish that there were more resources at the time that she felt she could take you know, advantage of to help her with that. But I guess one question is, um, I'd like to see you come into you know, Canton and work with some of the groups there and give some ideas. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. She actually graduated from Salem. Oh. It does. It does. Thank you. So yeah, I'd like to speak to you more. Thank you. Um, so I know I just we I know we had talked about just a quick social worker update, if that's okay. 
So we were, some of us have social workers, and I just wanted to give a little bit update on that. So in April 2021, we the board approved a social worker for Canton. Uh, we didn't get one in place th until September. That tells you the demand out there for social worker and psychologists. There just isn't enough help out there. Some of the things that we're seeing is that um, each municipality needs to set up a mo model that works for them. I know the city of Lansing hired direct. Uh, the, the social worker that they had years ago, just they quit because of burnout. They just didn't feel they were supported and they didn't, they, they just burned out. So that is something that I think some of our social workers needs, need to look at when they come into this and how we as communities can support them. We also have to look at when our social worker is considered a second responder in our community. So when the police go on a call, if they come to a mental health issue, they might call them and say, could you come in and talk to these people? Or they might just take their names and have them referred later on. Um, our social worker is through Hagira Health and her name is Renee and she's great. I just want to say since September, she has over 300 cases. Um, she's been able to do placement and referrals to about 56% of them. Uh, as you know, when our officers go into a home or our officers or our fire department go in, it's a crisis there, right? The chaos is going on. It's rapid, and you need help right then. Uh, one of the challenges that we found is that community mental health system is slow. So even though something is happening then, you can't always get them help right then. And so that's one of the big challenges that we're facing, community mental health responses. We need to figure out a way to match the need with the demand that's happening in our communities. So 300 cases is a lot. We're, we're looking at having another social worker. Um, um, in, in addition to what we're looking at for a senior, they basically came to us, the senior group, and said, can we have a social worker and maybe share it with the police? So that's adding more onto what we already have. Uh, we are grant funded through Hagira Health. Um, some of the things that have happened since we have a social worker is we have reduced the number of arrests um, because we handle it there on, in the home if we can or bring them in to handle it. We've reduced the number of ER transports, so we've been able to talk to family members to get them some assistance or get some transport or get them appointments somewhere. We've been able to increase connection to, to a treatment. We've reduced crisis-related calls for service because when our police go somewhere, they're able to say, call the social worker or they know what to do in order to get them help. Um, it's also more efficient use of officer time and resources. It takes some of the burden off of our police officers and our fire department, and it helps them so they're not in this crisis mode with our residents a lot when they're being called. Some of the challenges are language barriers. Canton is a very diverse community, and so sometimes they walk into a situation where there is a language barrier. So we are partnering with other organizations. There's something called um, My Family Services. They work with the South Asian American community, so they've partnered with us. We can call them into the home. We also have interfaith groups where we can bring some of the people in if we have different cultural you know, barriers there. Um, assisted outpatient treatment. You know, we we're the first one that initiated in Wayne County. But, you know, it's just some of the things that we're seeing out there. Also, in addition to this, you know, we're seeing increase in gun violence. Um, we're, uh, U of M, I think, just did a study. So that's something also that we can't exactly bring a social worker in right away. So that is another challenge that we're looking at. How can we work with our community on gun violence? Uh, we're all seeing this across all of our communities. So some of the things that we do see uh, suicide and depression are important, but the violence that we're seeing is killing more people. So we think, we're hoping that by using social worker and getting more referrals, we can calm down what we're seeing in our communities and hopefully get there. I know we'll talk about this more uh, September, in September when we have our next meeting, but I know other communities who have social workers are having similar or different, a little bit different experiences. I don't know if you want to sure. Just to add to that, it's my honored to be on that subcommittee also. Uh, and in the Norfolk community, myself and Supervisor Abbo, we have an embedded resource in our police department. They have been unbelievably used. We're in the midst of hiring another one right now. It's not only for the police, but for the fire. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to do after a week or two. We realized the need. And as we look around in COVID, and a lot of us are those emergency managers up here, almost one out of two people are having a hard time getting through COVID. 42% says the stats. So we need that, that outreach. Uh, we even talked about in that September meeting, University of Michigan, uh, we have a dean that lives in uh, Norfolk for social services, and he has offered, they do modules for mental health training in different segments, academia, business segment, the personal segment. They would offer to 
uh, modulate their modules and personalize them for CWW and our different communities. We are looking at that Northville show. I think in September, Jordan, we'll put them on the schedule. It is a big deal. We look around, one out of two of us are having a hard time getting through it. And we have shown in the Norfolk community with Supervisor Abel and myself, that need is there. Schools, the seniors, in all, we didn't think we'd use it as much in the fire departments. We are there with the fire departments too because of, you know, looking at uh, some mental health opportunities while things start. So, yes, I think that's something to, to add in September. As we said before, we would have probably done it in June, but we'll, we'll probably do that from University of Michigan. And there are 501c3. This is a subgroup of the whole social services area. If they want to help CWW and all of us. I think that's that's a great thing just to add to it. Well, thank said. you. And even as we're thinking about over the next couple of months, you know, what kind of legislation can help us since we're seeing some of the challenges with community mental health that I know Supervisor McNamara is on that board. He can help us with that also. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I, if any other communities at the September meeting want to come um, to discuss how their social workers are working with their police departments and or fire departments, that would be a good time to do it as well, just to give updates. Um, and that gives you some time to pull together some stats as well. I think that would be good. So just everyone can hear from their neighbors on how it's going. Um, thank you. And so we'll continue that discussion in September. I'm sure, sure that we will always be continuing this discussion because um, it's so important and needs to, as the girl said, needs to be talked about in order to attempt to bring remedy to it. Um, now we are going to move into a discussion about Great Lakes Water Authority and update kind of where everything is at. I'm going to um, just kind of update where we are right now in terms of what's gone on the last few days. And then Supervisor Heisey will speak more um, to next steps <clears throat> and any legality things that I may have missed. Um, as you got via email and is also at your seat, uh, Governor Whitmer sent in a letter to Great Lakes Water Authority um, basically saying you, you need to fix this, Highland Park needs to fix this, you should consider stopping charging um, the member communities for this debt going forward. Um, we had a meeting with the attorney from GLWA and they said in all these years, this is the first time they've had a direct correspondence from the governor. So they've had correspondence from staff and um, other people like that, but never from the governor directly. And then yesterday, yesterday late afternoon, um, <coughs> GLWA responded to the governor's letter and I believe we sent that out electronically. If not, we will. Um, but the hard copy is at your desk as well. Um, GLWA did receive $25 million from the state, which are ARPA funds. Those cannot be used to repay debt, um, but they could be used for infrastructure or maybe some other very creative ideas. Um, with that being said, so that happened, but also at the beginning of the week, um, the 2014, right? 2014 case? 2020. 2020, I, there's so many cases. There's so many. Um, one of the GLWA cases with Highland Park, um, the Judge Groner did come down with an order, and he said that Highland Park needs to start paying again. So remember, they have not paid any bills since April of 2021. No <laughs> sewer, no water. Um, he said, you've, you've got to start paying it. So if they don't start paying, and there's certain percentages and stuff in the order that they are being told to pay, if they don't start paying, GLWA can bring them back kind of for a contempt issue. Um, so with, with that being said, with these letters, the big ask, I think, on which Supervisor Heisey will talk a little bit more about, it, the big ask is saying to Great Lakes, okay, now you've got to stop. I mean, we've already, I'm going to go, I'm just going to read quickly the communities that have officially moved to withhold the Highland Park debt charges. If I've missed anyone, please just let me know. Um, and I know that there are various com communities that have this coming up next week. So for our communities, uh, the ones that are officially withholding are Belleville, Northville City, Livonia, Garden City, Wayne, Westland, Dearborn Heights, Plymouth Township, Northville Township, Sumter Township, Huron Township, and Romulus. I know Dearborn and Redford are set to take this up in the next week or two. 
um, DCC communities, not counting the ones of ours that cross over, Gibraltar, Gross Seal Township, Taylor, additional Wayne County communities, Gross Point, Gross Point Shores, Gross Point Park, and Gross Point Woods, and in Macomb County, Sterling Heights, St. Clair Township, and Macomb Township, but also um, with Macomb, I know that a number of communities have the resolution also coming up for consideration. So Supervisor Heiser. Okay, thank you. Well, it's been a busy couple of weeks, uh, so I think a lot of the things that we've been doing here over the last couple of months have had a great impact on what's happening at the GLWA and um, I think obviously in Lansing too with the governor's office. So we, we've certainly gotten people's attention. So if you haven't um, uh, escrowed your, your Highland Park assessments yet, uh, continue to do so because we are still uh, engaged in active uh, discussions with all of the relevant parties. Um, we've also taken the time to meet with, uh, have a, we had a separate meeting via Zoom with uh, uh, Randall Brown, who is the Corporation Counsel for GLWA. It was a very productive meeting. We pretty much agreed, and this that meeting was I think yesterday, it's just this week has been a, a blur. Sure, might have been yesterday. I think it was yesterday. So. I don't know. It was sometime this week. So what we've done is we've, we've parked temporarily the idea of going to federal court to try to get some clarification on the issues here. Um, and, but we're, we're still holding that in reserve in case we need it. Um, there is a possibility that we might join with Great Lakes Water Authority in a, a federal action to get clarification, especially on the issue of what really constitutes a bad debt versus a, a an adverse judgment in a lawsuit. Um, Obviously, they think a bad debt is an adverse judgment, so they can pass that along to us. Obviously, we disagree. Um, and then we had during the week the, uh, the Judge Groner decision, which was very favorable to us. There was also some good language in there as well in, in the judge's opinion, dealing with um, the, uh, the responsibilities of, of GLWA, you know, not to pass along costs to the, to the residents. So... Um, I think we're making great progress. Uh, we're going to continue to update you over the summer months. Um, I've also been in touch with a uh, couple Oakland County commissioners. Um, they're having a real hard time getting information from the uh, CEO's office and the water resources commissioner. Um, so I actually had to pass along some of the information that we FOIA'd from Oakland County and gave it to mm -hmm. the Oakland County commissioners because they weren't getting it. So uh, they, they have their own issues there. The, um, also have had discussions with uh, Candace Miller from Macomb County. Uh, she and her delegate to the Great Lakes Water Authority have been very helpful and uh, have been providing us with information and insight uh, that, that they've been able to obtain. So, um, in fact, there was going to be a hearing next week in Lansing uh, in front of Representative Johnson, mm -hmm. off, uh, in front of his uh, committee, and that, that hearing has been canceled. Uh, in light of these recent developments, but I think they're still going to look to have some kind of a hearing in June. So that's good to know. Um, and we'll certainly be updated on that. I, I think Candace Miller has been definitely the force pushing that, uh, that hearing. So um, where we stand right now, because Highland Park uh, has been ordered to pay um, a a major portion of their arrearages to GLWA because the governor has committed $25 million. Um, I'm not sure if that was ARPA money or not, but I hope it wasn't. No, it was. It was, yeah. okay, because ARPA money can't be used for current debt or uh, a judgment. Um, but maybe there's, maybe there's some ways that we can smooth that out over time. Uh, with that all being said, and with, uh, uh, I think, a, a, us moving in a positive direction, you know, I'd certainly be happy to have our communities as an advocate for the state and for GLWA to, to move this along to a mutual resolution. But until that time, I think that we have to, um, I think we have to uh, assert ourselves as communities uh, in light of these recent developments. And um, with that in mind, uh, we've taken a... a crack at um, a, a rough draft here of what a, a CWW resolution would look like. A lot of it is, is boilerplate. You've seen it before, uh, but at the end, uh, there is uh, the proposed resolution would state that the Great Lakes Water Authority, we are, we, would, we are asking that the Great Lakes Water Authority immediately suspend all current and future Highland Park-related assessments to the member communities. Uh, 
Uh, number two, that the state of Michigan and the Great Lakes Water Authority reimburse all customer communities past assessments relating to the Highland Park litigation. So that is a request to claw back the money that has already been, uh, been assessed. Uh, and then thirdly, that the governor and the Great Lakes Water Authority work to resolve all outstanding issues between Highland Park and GLWA to prevent future situations of this nature. Um, how they want to do that, um, I would recommend that the governor convene a, a task force or a, a special committee of stakeholders uh, to um, work out some of these longstanding issues between GLWA and Highland Park, uh, that they maybe resolve the issue of what constitutes bad debt, um, and try to do that outside of the, of the courtroom. Um, it, it may at some point, we may have to get in, in front of a federal judge to order some of these changes. Um, but uh, for the time being, I think we have to, the communities and GLWA and the state of Michigan need to show uh, due diligence in, in trying to resolve these issues on our own. So my recommendation is that the board uh, uh, adopt this uh, resolution with the language that I've outlined therein. And I'll, I, I'll make that motion. Support. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. So we will see you in September in Canton Township. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. Laura? All right. Good morning. Um, at your seat, you also have a draft letter uh, for the U.S. Employment and Training Administration. They have proposed a rule which would alter the way that Michigan works operates. Currently, states have maximum flexibility in how they provide employment services. In Michigan, we have over 400 people on the Michigan Work staff who serve over 86,000 residents annually. The new rule would force Michigan to use uh, state staff only for these positions, and it would potentially close many Michigan Works offices. According to Michigan Works, if this rule becomes official, we will lose nearly 300 staff and have significant delays in services for those 86,000 job seekers and 32,000 businesses who utilize Michigan Works annually. Basically, what they want to do is instead of being a Michigan Works employee, you would shift over to an official state employee um, based in Lansing, is my understanding, and you would work for the unemployment office uh, doing a little bit of employment services, but mostly unemployment claims. So we would lose a lot of flexibility and a lot of the opportunities that Michigan Works provides uh, employment seekers. The Downriver Community Conference actually flagged this for us uh, because they are a Michigan Works office. So this is really important to them and it will affect greatly um, all of our communities. So there is a draft letter if you choose to send one and in the email I will include a flyer that has a little bit more information on this proposed rule change. Next I want to talk to, uh, briefly about family treatment courts. Representative Mary Whiteford has introduced House Bill 5340, which would authorize circuit courts to adopt or institute family treatment courts. A treatment court would be a court-supervised treatment program for those with a civil child abuse or neglect case who are diagnosed with substance use disorder and or a program designed to adhere to the family treatment court best practice standards created by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals and the Center for Children and Family Futures. Uh, a person who is a known violent offender would not be eligible for this court. There's about a 10 page analysis of uh, what this would create and I will attach that as well to the email. It's very involved. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of uh, rules that they'd have to follow, uh, but I will send that along with this report. Uh, they had a hearing in the house and I do believe this will move soon to the floor. Uh, Open Meetings Act and FOIA changes for the Detroit Zoo and the DIA. Senate Bills 818 and 819 would force the Detroit Zoo and the Detroit Institute of Arts to disclose how they spend their money. At issue is the $22 million the DIA receives and the $5.8 million from the zoo, or to the zoo uh, from tax levies of local residents. Under current law, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties have boards who distribute tax money to the zoo and the DIA. These boards fall under FOIA and the Open Meetings Act, but once the money gets to where it's going, they no longer, uh, we can no longer follow how the money is spent. 
The Senate Oversight Committee recently held a hearing on these bills, but no vote was taken. Um, my belief is that it will move to the floor before they break for the summer in June. Uh, May bond proposals. Um, I know that we have a handful of committee or, uh, communities that have bond proposals coming up. So in May, most of them passed. This is just an FYI, including Kalamazoo Public Schools, Holly Area Schools, Gro uh, Goodland Township Library, and then Clearwater Township and Fenville Public Safety Millages. <laughs> A quick note on redistricting, the final maps have been published online. This link will take you right to them, and I will, that's of course will be clickable in the report. And then lastly, we want to congratulate the new uh, House of Representatives member for Dearborn, Jeffrey Pepper. He was elected during the May 2022 local elections to fill the remainder of now Dearborn Mayor Abdullah Hamoud's term. He has been assigned to the Families, Children, and Seniors Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Uh, they, the legislature should be passing the budget before they break in June. Um, since we do not have a June meeting this year, I will send out everything that I get once they pass that and they are done. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Elected officials comments. Is there any elected officials that have comments today? Thank you. Dennis Davidson from the Wayne County Treasurer's Office. Um, back, I think, in January or February, um, Treasurer Sabree came to this body and introduced a new program called MyHAP, which was a state program which is designed to help people all over the state who are going through foreclosure or going through problems with utility payments and other things. This program will provide up to $26,000 for back taxes and utilities. Uh, since we've started this program in Wayne County, uh, 18,380 people have applied for my app. Um, also in uh, February, we had over 17,000 people um, looking at foreclosure. Uh, and uh, Treasurer Spree uh, went to court and got the 2019 tax extended one more year so they can go until uh, March 31st of 2023. Uh, of the 17,000, uh, only 4,326 people, our residents, uh, got into the program. And most of these residents were eight eligible. Uh, it was just a matter of trying to get the word out. And we've done that through various communities in this room. Uh, and we appreciate your help and everything you've done to try and cut down on foreclosures. So we cut down by 75% of the foreclosures uh, for uh, this tax year. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi, um, Larissa Richardson, Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, sending greetings from her this morning. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for today's conversation regarding uh, mental health and the importance of supporting our communities through um, what we know as still the pandemic um, and just the importance of providing funding and those resources within our community. So thank you for that. And then also for today's conversation around um, the letters regarding LIWA and uh, from the governor's office, we stand ready to support pro it um, in any way, um, our communities and making sure that um, this issue is resolved um, and we're doing the best uh, for all of our communities here in Western Wayne. Um, so thank you for that. And I do want to just um, briefly mention that um, in response to a lot of the infrastructure issues we see within the 13th Congressional District, um, Congresswoman Tlaib last month introduced um, the Get the Let Out Caucus, which is designed in um, support of making sure that we're finding full funding to replace uh, lead pipe infrastructure within our communities. Um, and so we'll be hosting hopefully a tour in the next couple of months to talk about um, the importance of infrastructure dollars and also removing uh, lead pipe replace uh, lead pipes within our community. So um, just wanted to announce that. Um, and I think, uh, again, just want to offer our support in any way um, on all the issues that uh, were mentioned today. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, everyone. I want to take advantage of this time to at least formally introduce myself. Um, my name is Eddie Fukori. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations. So you're familiar with Andy Kendrivas. He and I 
are working hand in hand uh, through this transition, but I'll be serving in that capacity uh, moving forward. But um, many of you I've met, whether through Zoom or other, I am available to all of you. I'll be hopefully having a few minutes after the meeting ends today to introduce myself one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'm not new to the county. I've been with Mr. Evans' executive team since 2015. And um, I'm here to help in any way that I can and listen. Um, I do want to uh, state that Mr. Evans' administration finds the GLIWA um, topic of highest priority, and they are working diligently with the state and local officials, um, him and his cabinet. So it is definitely something that he's addressing, um, and I'm sure we'll have some communications in the future. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, public comment? This would be the time for the public to comment. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Okay. Any other business? Seeing none, can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll give you that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. See you in September.